Welcome to Westworld FM, a podcast about HBO's Westworld. My name is Alex. And my name is Nick. And boy, boy have we got, got a podcast, podcast for, for you. you. Today we are d- going to discuss episode one of the show, titled The Original. While we will not be discussing any next time on information on the show, we will be spoiling the whole first episode. So if you have not watched it yet, hit pause on this and go check out the episode before listening to the rest of this podcast. You can find more episodes of our podcast at westworld.fm. We're also Westworld FM on Twitter, and you can send feedback to westworldfm at gmail.com to tell us what you think of our show and share your thoughts on HBO's Westworld so we can read them on the air. Send us corrections, observations, or anything regarding Westworld or our podcast. So, uh, first episode aired last night. Yes. Uh, we got our first look at the intro. What did you think about the intro? The, uh, you know, I only watched the episode one time. Yeah. Which I should probably state in advance because usually I, I would well i guess with our other show i also only watch them once generally. yeah but, but i usually came fresh off of a viewing mm-hmm. uh, which just seemed to work out for me with this one i have a, i had a, a night i had 24 hours in between and uh that may not have been good but we'll see uh the intro it's cool yeah it didn't pop You're to me too much by it? It cr- yeah pretty much but that's I, the wrong use of that term so i apologize to orwell but, fans but, but that may be uh how i feel i don't know <laughs> I think it's I think it's really neat. I just need more time to kind of absorb it because yeah. I think there's a lot going on there that I'm just not picking up on. But yeah. I like all the elements. I like watching the the horse and the rider being constructed. I like the repeated references to the player piano. I think that's really cool. Mm-hmm. I can't peg down the theme really though. It's kind of it, there's a, it feels like there's a lot going on musically in that intro. Yeah, there's a lot of little things. Whereas like other shows, you latch on very quickly to like what the dominant. Well, the, the um, composer is Ramin Javadi, who right. did Game of Thrones, which is a very, like, this is our theme. Right. Oh, yeah. It comes crashing right out of the gate at you. Yeah. And, like, uh, Gone to Texas is very, or I'm sorry, Preacher, Preacher. Is, very, is very distinct, <laughs> as is our theme for Gone to Texas. <laughs> and uh, I think of, like, Daredevil. You know, you know it right when you hear it. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of th- TV shows where they seem to really it's it's almost more minimal and this feels like almost like an overture type situation yeah. where there's a lot which going is on. interesting considering it's kind of a western thing. right so the overture thing kind of fits but i yeah it's not like a very overt theme but i do really like it i like the kind of feelings of creepiness and like automation and everything that it kind of invokes i like the shots of the of the robot the robot playing the playing, playing, the, playing theme. the theme yeah, yeah that's cool. and that's that's pretty interesting too so i think it's pretty cool um i'm excited to see it more and kind of latch on to things that right are like I, I wonder if they'll do kind of the game of thrones thing where what they depict differs with what's going on in the that show would be neat maybe Who i knows? always i always liked that reason to pay attention to the titles and yeah it shakes it up a little bit so we'll see we'll see what else comes in the intro but we can move on to the actual episode now uh so we open on dolores played by evan rachel wood in what i called the dream world or rather the west world labs uh jeffrey wright's character bernard is asking her a series of diagnostic questions to understand whether or not the host is straying from its programming so I guess hosts, that's what they're called. Yeah. So remember. that's the thing I was going to say. There might be little parts where we need to like clarify the vocabulary. The host are the robots that are in the park, which is much more elegant than robots, which <laughs> is how they're referred to in the movie, which <laughs> yeah. is really funny. Um, and so we get this kind of opening of Jeffrey Wright asking these questions. It's a little bit of exposition to kind of tell us what's going on within the park and that sort of thing. And, and we get kind of feelings of how these hosts operate in Westworld. Um, and then we see Dolores waking up in her house and she walks down to greet her father. Uh, we get a shot of the player piano, uh, starting to play, uh, kind of signifying the start of a day as we see throughout the rest of the episode. And, uh, we get a little glimpse of Teddy, uh, or James Marsden, as we know him as an actor on a train into town. We think he's a newcomer. I would think is a, a good way to put it. Right. Yes. Uh, we think he's a guest. They, they, the, the, the hosts call them newcomers, but the, the management call them guests. Mm-hmm. So we can kind of go back and forth with that. Uh, Teddy strolls into town, asked by the sheriff to get an outlaw that's out in the, uh, out in the you know, netherworld. But he heads to a bar instead and drinks some rye whiskey before he spots Dolores outside. And as he walks up to Dolores, uh, we see that they know each other or they remember each other. Dolores remembers him, even though we know that she's a, she's a host or a robot. Um, 
So what did you think about that kind of? So you were in the bag. You thought that Teddy was a real person. I actually, I really didn't. You right didn't? Off, no. Why not? I, there was something about the way it was presented that was funny. Uh, and I'm not sure what it was, but I remember when he was walking up the street and he has that exchange with the the posse that's rounding up to try to go track down uh, the Hector. Yeah, yeah, Hector. Something about that whole interaction. I was like, this is kind of funny. And I, I don't know. For some reason, I just... I just had this hinky feeling that he wasn't. Yeah, and I'm I guess not, it, I'm not saying that to try to seem contrarian or, or ahead of the well, ahead of the ball because nobody is more along for the ride with stuff like this than me. <laughs> and I usually never see really obvious twists coming. But for some reason, with that, I was the whole time. I was like the interaction just felt. I, I guess maybe because Jonathan Nolan's attached to it, and I kind of anticipated some some kind of some, sleight of hand. Yeah. Okay. And I and there's a lot more to to come later, but I. It, it all seemed it also his exchange with Dolores seemed too on the nose. And I, and I, I could totally see that storyline existing, that he's a, a repeat customer who comes back and he's fallen in love with this host and, and he re- keeps coming back to Westworld. And I was like, oh, that would be an interesting storyline to follow. But yeah. for some reason, I was like, I don't know. Some, there's some something it, more. There's something more to him. And there might, some of it might be the idea. I think any time that we're in the train in this episode the newcomers are all talking they're all like excitedly like oh i'm gonna do this thing or hey we've done this before and he's just sitting there absorbing the world waking up yeah (laughs) yeah so that's kind of i guess that's kind of a little bit of shorthand of like he's not a human but i do like that and i guess we'll talk a little bit more in a in a moment but i i also i think that the the voiceover that dolores has as she's coming down the stairs and she's describing the world how she chooses to see the positivity yeah and 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 that bit i think is really important because i think it's kind of a nolan apparently now a nolan brother trademark to have <laughs> vo that may not be what you think it is and it may mean something different than you're taking it at face value okay interesting uh so we can s- continue on here we've got uh dolores and uh teddy are outside watching all of dolores's father's uh, steer all of his cows and she points out, that's the Judas steer. The rest will follow wherever you make him go. Which I think is an important line. Maybe mm-hmm. it's an important line. Who knows? But uh, if we think... There's a line later on where the man in black calls one of the robots livestock. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, analogy will be important. Yes. Uh, seemingly. Um, and she says that there's a path for everyone as well. So we, we kind of get glimpses of the programming of her programming, at least in the beginning here, we think. Uh, but at nighttime, the herd is still roaming and Teddy goes, uh, which Dolores thinks is strange. So Teddy runs up to the house and I finds the part. I laughed so hard. Yeah. So watching, he, watching James Mars and rear up on a horse and go, stay here, Dolores, or stay put, Dolores. <laughs> was really funny. It, just, it, it was classic, like Western moment. And it really cracked me up. Yeah. Um, he runs up to the house and there's people that are, are, uh, that have killed Dolores's mom and are in the process of killing her father. And then he shoots both of them, uh, as well. But as he's kind of in the house and Dolores comes up to see what was going on, we get Ed Harris as the man in black showing up and, uh, he's there to basically, he, so we find out that Ed Harris has been coming back for 30 years. He's been doing this for a while, uh, which gives us some history to the park. It gives us some history to how long Dolores has been there. Um, and we also see Teddy walks out to try and intervene the situation. Uh, but uh, the man in black starts dragging Dolores off. And then Teddy goes to fire at him. And uh, he can't damage the man in black. So that's kind of our revelation that Teddy is actually a host. The man in black must be a human because he can't be harmed. Or something weird is going on, but he's probably a human. Um, And uh, he had an interesting line here. It said, winning doesn't mean anything unless someone else loses. Uh, Which gives you a little bit of psychology behind some of the guests thinking and and coming to this park. The idea that even if they want to be bad guys, they got to have somebody... You know, e- even if you want to win in a bad way, somebody else has to lose and they have to program that way and, and make sure that these situations and narratives are kind of set up in that way. And he has a line later in the episode where he refers to it again as sort of a game that yes. nobody else is playing the game, but he's the only one. Everybody else is there to get a, to get their rocks on. Right. He's and there to play the game. To play. Interesting. 
Uh, so the man in black drags Dolores in the barn, shoots Teddy, and he says, God damn, it feels good to be back. And then we've got uh, Bernard and Dolores. The dialogue suggests that she is... So so it's kind of a diagnostic test that he's giving her in the voiceover that we're hearing. Right. And this is kind of the point where it ends, and it kind of suggests that she's okay. She hasn't undergone any trauma where she has... D- um diverged from her programming Mm -hmm. at least in the beginning here uh so that's kind of the first act of the show that's the first cut to black any main thoughts about that uh two things that really pop so having watched the movie yeah i I would be curious to talk to someone who hasn't seen the movie who watches the show because there were two things that seemed different to me uh one being kind of a two point in that the host's reset every 24 hours yeah. it seems that they have a set memory set and expected you know probably nearly infinite paths of of performance well but they don't they it may not be 24 hours we don't necessarily know it seems like at the start of every new day right. but that we could have just been seeing the beginning of a new cycle every time it's unclear. I would say it's a day. It's because suggested it's a day. The I guests think. seem to pay by the day, or at yeah. least they did in the movie. Yeah. And uh, I, I would imagine it's a day. It only seems logical for. for I think them. I think so too. But it's I think there's enough room in the editing for there they for could, it to be something that's different true. than that. They could. Uh, the human storyline seems to progress in a day by day basis, though. Yeah. So or in terms of the park par- personnel. Uh, but the other, so that was interesting to me because in the movie it's not really they're much more robotic so it seems like they almost don't think about their actions they just they just act them out as like you know the old Pirates of the Caribbean ride would they're just going yeah. through the motions kind of thing and in this they, they and, do their thing until they're interrupted by right an and in this force. they seem much more able to kind of drift around yeah and yeah. That, and that you know days. Days could go by, daily cycles where they never interact even remotely with a guest, and they, and who knows? E- even so, their the hosts' own interactions might interrupt each other's certain chains. Yep, which is really really fun to think about. Yeah, <laughs> really really cool. But the uh, for some reason the the hard reset every twenty four hours was something that didn't occur to me, and it's it's just another. It's already a huge piece of praise for the show that it already made me view them less robotic and more like they undergo trauma and the fact that they don't remember it every 24 hours is pretty crazy. And it brings me to one of my questions that I'll bring up later, but that's another thing. Uh, the other thing is the, the man in black being a, a guest yeah. versus a host is really cool. Yeah. I did not expect that. I didn't either. I was like, Oh man, it's the man in black. He's right. Here. Yeah. The and gunslinger and in the, and all the marketing materials I saw him and I was like, Oh, Ed Harris, that's really cool. And I kind of expected them to go down a similar path that he would be a rogue host or some some kind of trademark host that everyone knew yeah but the fact that he's this men he's still a menace but he's a human is pretty cool and it kind of sets up i think early on for the viewer that these hosts are going to be very sympathetic characters and yeah. if not the central characters that we're supposed to care about yeah so i think that's great that's yeah. awesome and ed harris it's always a pleasure to yeah, see it absolutely absolutely yeah i uh i think it's a pretty whiz bang 15 minutes to start off an episode i think it's it doesn't it kind of gradually eases you in but it's interesting because i watched the show with my girlfriend who did not watch the movie and i think she she kind of turned to me and i'd given her like a one-line premise of oh they're in a western theme park and people pay to be there every day and there's robots that are in it and she was like i don't know how anybody would understand that they're in a theme park like at this point in the show, she's like, I don't understand how anybody would know that they're in a theme park until like without seeing the movie. And then I was like, well, I think they'll get there. And then like the next scene was basically, you know, breaking that. Down. But yeah. So um, so we reopen on Dolores in bed and Teddy on the train like Groundhog Day, essentially, as you were saying, uh, we pull out to the train to show kind of a tabletop display of Westworld in the Westworld laboratory. Uh, We see horses being manufactured in the laboratory and androids being tested and examined. And Bernard, uh, played by Jeffrey Wright and Elsie Hughes, who I don't know who plays her, unfortunately. uh, They're uh, they're watching a brothel worker with a small flourish or a reverie, as it's called later in the show. Basically, a piece of programming that was put in by Anthony Hopkins' character, Ford, uh, that has her touching her lips and kind of recalling past memories that she shouldn't 
have any access to. And Bernard basically gets called away due to a livestock warning, quote unquote, uh, in the storage of androids below. But as he walks away, Elsie kisses the brothel worker and she kind of smiles about it. Uh, it's kind of, it's weird. The way that she, that Elsie's looking at her in the first place, like my initial thoughts were that maybe she's, she feels somewhat threatened by the existence of these things. But then when she kisses her and maybe enjoys it or realizes how realistic it feels or something like that, her, it, her demeanor kind of changed to me. So it's a small moment. I don't know if you had any thoughts on it in particular, but... <sighs> You know, it definitely struck me, but I haven't I haven't processed that scene yeah. really yet. That would be a thing that I would uh, upon a, That's a, a, a second, second closer kind of viewing. Deal. Yeah, I would definitely. Yeah, it's be it's, it's a I very. Think I think you're kind of right, though. I think it's also, in a weird way, I think it's almost like, I, I don't what I, what is her role at the park? So, so she's kind of like uh, she's kind of Jeffrey Wright's. She's right like a, a tech woman. person. Yeah. she's not. A, she's she's, she's not one of the management. Okay, yeah, she's one of the more operations kind of. Uh, it almost it almost weirdly. I mean, I think that there's a lot going on in that moment, but I think there's also just a weird moment of like creator enjoying creation yeah. in a way, and like really realizing like this the wonder of the technology right and and on seeing how you could be lured in and mm-hmm. it's like jeffrey wright says i think later when he says it's those little details that make them feel real that make the guests fall in love with them yeah and i think there's that there's that kind of moment where it the, the moment is so uncanny and you just want to reach out and and ve- your own brain wants wants to know you gotta feel you gotta know yeah. right right interesting yeah absolutely um so uh we see Bernard uh, talking with the uh, head of operations. I think her name is Cullen is her last name. Oh, she's and great. I she's gotta... she's fantastic. She's from uh, Denmark, I believe, and she's 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 got a very interesting accent and it's just very engaging. Um, but we see Ashley Stubbs, who's played by the elder Hemsworth brother. In case you didn't know that, uh, is he the elder? Okay, He's the Andrew that. to their Luke and Owen. Uh, very good. Yes. Great analogy. too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he's there with Bernard, apparently one of the uh, robots and one of the hosts in storage has been activated and they don't know what's going on. So um, they go down to check out what's up with the livestock and the sub deck and they take an elevator down to the sub level and the sub levels in disrepair. We see very creepy uh, array of hosts standing there naked they all look very cadaverish too and it's, it's sub level 83 right yeah b83 is what they call it yeah that's crazy so there's a lot of something they gotta have yeah. a lot of storage or something going sure. on um but uh so they walk through all of these androids and they see ford played by anthony hopkins uh sitting there having a chat with who turns out to be the second oldest host that they ever made it's kind of this old Old Bill. Old Bill. And and they're just sitting there drinking, having a chat. And uh, it, we kind of learn here that Anthony, ha- they, they can put them to sleep by saying something about a deep and dreamless slumber or sleep to them. Right. So he immediately kind of stops operating. Oh, it's so cool. Too. It's a very interesting visual effect to see an actor just stop. <laughs> um, and then... Well, that's no mere actor. That's Michael Wincott, I found out later. Oh, really? Which okay. is so awesome. <laughs> I love Michael what Wincott. What else would our audience know Michael Wincott from? Anything. He's in so <laughs> much stuff that I always lose track. He's in The Crow. He's in The Count of Monte Cristo. He's in Alien Resurrection. These are really weird movies I'm naming. He's in. <laughs> uh, he does lots of voice work because he's got such a distinct voice. Yeah. Uh, let me see Let me, let me. me see what IMDb pulls up for the top, top few uh, Michael Wincott jams. Well, we the get crow, this really alien resurrection. <laughs> oh, he's in Robin Hood. That's right. The the um, uh, Kevin Costner one. Oh. He's in tons of stuff, and as soon as you see him or hear his voice, he's very distinct. But I didn't recognize him in this, which was crazy. Yeah, because I love Michael Wincott. Um, we and we we see Ford ask him to put himself away. Yeah, it's so, so he cool. lays down on the table and takes off his hat, zips his bag back up. I thought that was really cool and interesting. And then we get to have this, con- we see this conversation between Bernard and Ford. Uh, I forget what Ford's first name is. I, I can it's Robert. Robert Ford. But that could just be a real person. <laughs> uh, it is Robert Ford. Robert Ford, yeah. Dr. Bob Ford. Um, so they have this conversation, and the one thing that I really pulled out of it was that uh, Ford says a simple handshake would give them away in reference to the, the older models, 
which I thought was a little bit of a nod to the movie because the hands were the thing that gave away whether or not they were they were robots in yeah. the original. Yeah. So I thought that that was kind of cool. Uh, so that and that was the next kind of act break. Anything in there that you want to unpi- unpack or that did we my, stop along the way? That was my favorite scene in yeah. the episode. Oh, yeah, by far. Yeah. I, I really like... So So they get the alert saying there's like un, there's unusual activity down there, right? Yeah. So they go to check it out thinking maybe one of them went nuts or something. I think it does say livestock warning on his phone or whatever he right. picks up. So, But all that happened is Hopkins went down there to have a chat with old Bill, yeah. which is really cool. At the, it was at this point, I also watched it with my girlfriend who liked it quite a bit. And I just... I I didn't know the rules yet, or you know, didn't know much about the this this version of Westworld yet. And when it said that warning, and they were going down there with the team, she's like, "What what do you think's down there?" And I said, "There's probably a naked James Marsden running around down there, <laughs> just <laughs> thinking like he'd gone rogue already." But no, yeah, the second best thing that could have happened was there, and it was Michael Wincott. <laughs> I I loved that scene, and it's uh, I'm going to come around to this later, but the acting in this is so absolutely top notch. Yeah. And I think it's a combination of great casting, great writing, and Jonathan Nolan actually being a really sweet director. Yeah. And I don't know how much of this may have been ghost directed by anybody else, but I was really impressed. And the whole time I was watching with a hypercritical eye, because I was like, well, Joan, are you going to be able to do it or not? <laughs> it is very good. Don't but want another this... transcendence on our hands. <laughs> right. <laughs> I want to actually transcend. <laughs> The casting of Anthony Hopkins is one of those actors who, to me, is a lot like Tom Hanks. He's a lot like Matt Damon, where there's these actors where their celebrity or their past work almost always threatens to overshadow their their current or future work. And Tom Hanks was the latest example for me when we went to see Captain Phillips. Yeah. And I thought, oh, it's just Tom Hanks, man. He's just so Tom Hanks. Yep. And by the end of that movie, which I really enjoyed, I was like totally immersed in his performance because yep. that's that's the, one of the qualities of a great actor is that ability to kind of disappear and convince you that they are who they are portraying. And Hopkins, I, I never give him enough credit. And it's not because I think he's bad, but I, I always think either his casting is like kind of on the nose. Like we need a... It's we need kinda, Anthony Hopkins in this movie. Right. We need an Anthony right. Hopkins type. And they put that <laughs> and they just end up giving him a call. And uh, I made this joke about Hugo Weaving a <laughs> yeah. long time ago with Captain America that they just have a file the cabinet and they open the drawer for villain and they just <laughs> scroll the Hugo Weaving and pull it out and say, there you go. Yep. And Hopkins feels like another one of those types of guys, but he's able to, he's just so top notch at what he does that he's able to convey so much so quickly. Yeah. And he, despite playing one of the all time best movie villains, he's so good at being this sympathetic touching guy and he in this scene he's so sad yeah and it's amazing and he just instantly you get it you're like here's an old guy who once created something beautiful and now (laughs) it's been blown up into something different and although he's still involved he's he's not really in control anymore like i just Mm -hmm. immediately this guy's whole story was written on his face and this fact that he goes down to sub level 83 to have a chat with old bill and like actually drink whiskey with him yeah and that line where old bill's just talking and and, it, and it's kind of a bummer because it feels like old bill's just kind of reciting his programming yeah not necessarily he, having a conversation yeah, but be, he might be we don't really know yeah but when he talks about he's like, he says he's seen he's seen a gunfight or he's seen a few gunfights in his day and hopkins just kind of smiles and says more than more you, than you more know, than you know. Yeah. and the way he says it is so sad because like he knows this whole rich history of old bill and all the stuff he's been the two of them have been together for X amount of years. Yeah. And old Bill just kind of like sips his whiskey and like laughs like, yeah, I've been in a lot of gunfights. I'm pretty cool. Yeah. And it just that whole exchange was so, so, so wonderful. And it's yeah. almost like the relationship that you have with your own things. You have your own personal history and it's just a thing. Yeah. But you project onto it. And it's so uh, that that scene just blew me away. I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. Totally. No, I, I completely agree. And I I did kind of take it at like the, the, the conversation just feel very asymmetrical and and i took it as kind of like because it, this is like model two maybe there's just that limitation to the programming at that time like maybe he's just that glimpse into what these things used to be yeah so i, I loved the way he moved also cool. there was a lot there was lots of weird little halting yeah and you can you can hear little bits yep, and pieces yep. in, the, in the like you could it wasn't exactly like whirring or anything like that, but you could just kind of hear it's like mechanical. little servos just kind of coming on and off. Yep. Yeah. As he moved around and, and especially when he went to lay down yep. and it just kind of was these weird little like robot dance motions. It was yeah. so cool. I was like, man, whether if they enhanced this in post, which they probably did that, or Michael Winkoss just that sweet. It doesn't matter. It was I, great. From what uh, I read, uh, there's a slash film uh, interview with Jonathan Nolan that came out today 
And he does say that there are some visual effects that are put onto the actors sure. to I would enhance think. their robat- robotic qualities. Sure. I will say that I didn't, I don't think I could have, I may have assumed, but I could not pick them out necessarily. And as I was watching through this the second or part of the second time today, I was sitting there watching their faces as they're trying to interact, just looking for something to latch on to in that department. And I can't. And I love that this is that good. At, mm-hmm. Like they 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 put that much time into these effects to make it that good. So that's very cool. Uh, so we'll move on to the next section of the show. We open again on the Abernathy household with uh, Dolores waking up. Starts out pretty similar to the first time, but it adds a little bit more context to the situation about, oh, there's robbers out there. Uh, Dolores come back before dark, that kind of thing. Uh, the train pulls into town again and Teddy gets off, but he's a little bit later because his hat gets knocked off. And we see some of that conditional programming happening because Teddy uh, ends up moving past the uh, the sheriff and the people talking about going to get Hector. And one of the guests actually gets asked, oh, you look like you could do this. Let's go check it out. That kind of thing. So I think we get a little bit about that. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Uh that that scene is just so they're so dumb. They're just a, they're like the lamest <laughs> touristy. They, yeah. yep. car- oh, it's so awesome. The, he turns to his wife and goes, "What do you think, honey? <laughs> sounds like fun. It like, sounds like fun. Hey, let's let's get our money out of here. Go catch some bandits. <laughs> let's round up a posse and go <laughs> shoot some Mexicans. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it's great. Like it's so so over the top that it's it's absolutely pitch perfect for the scene. I also want to know the story behind the giant host that runs into james marsden in the yeah. morning the guy looks like the undertaker it's yep. hilarious <laughs> uh and then teddy uh teddy spots dolores outside again but uh he goes to run to see her and then we get another guest walk up and interrupt him from that programming and be like oh hey i saw you from last time that i was here let's let's use him as our guide what's going on teddy how you been Mm -hmm. and so the man in black walks up to dolores who doesn't necessarily recognize him uh and he says well i got other plans today and and just kind of walks off and does his own thing he goes into the saloon to play uh cards with uh kissy who's the dealer um yeah what are your this thoughts? This scene, this particular scene, raised and raised a question for me, which is on my list of questions. Okay, do you want to do some questions? Sure, let's hear between? some questions. Okay, well, here's one question. At what? How, I I want to know how the and maybe this was answered, but I don't think it was because I was paying close attention for this answer. How exactly the hosts are programmed to respond when their current course of action is interrupted, or when references to past events are thrown their way, or even it's all within the same kind of question when a guest tells them that they're hosts because they seem to think they're people yeah they seem to think they're normal people living normal lives this is just what they are and who they are and so when when teddy gets interrupted by the like the guy who's like hey this this guy showed me around last time i was here come on hey what's up teddy he just kind of has this like kind of puzzled look on his face and he he kind of just kind of looks like weirdly placid. He, like the, the, that interruption, and we see him again later when the guys are at the at the, the brothel. brothel. Yeah. Um, that interruption seems to almost put him in like a passive hosting state yes. or something like that. And yeah. it's almost the same for Dolores when the man in black walks up and hands her her canned good. And then he says, he calls her by name and all that stuff. And she just kind of, again, gives him the same kind of look <laughs> where it's, it's probably almost like the look in real life when you come yeah. across somebody that knows you and you can't place who they <laughs> yeah. are. And you're, you probably look the exact same. We're just kind of like, hey. it's like when your GPS tells you it's recalculating. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like rerouting. It's kind of, <laughs> yeah. It's, pr- they're, it's like they're processing that information. And ultimately Dolores doesn't have to do anything with that information. Right. It just kind of walks away. And I think the same thing happens later when that kid tells her you're one of them, aren't you? Like she, yeah, she just skirts the issue and just says, "I've got to, I've got to be going." Yeah, and you guys should too. There's bandits, and and it's, it's almost my number one question, uh, is it, and it's probably not that important. It's probably yeah. not important at all. I should just accept it and move on. But it's, it's so interesting. You, you to wanna, me. you wanna see the logic table I do. of I just, like the yeses and nos and the hands <laughs> and the ors oh and all that no, stuff. No, I don't want to see that. I, <laughs> I, I do. do. <laughs> I want the t- Yeah, I know you do. You want the spreadsheet with all the all the programming. <laughs> Yeah, all the possible avenues they could go down. Yeah, no, it's and it's it's inevitably going to be a, a limitation of the show. You can't 
you you can't ask someone to explain a supercomputer in an hour or 10 hours yeah even. like it's just it's just going to be especially as as uh uh sizemore says later across thousands of narrative possible narratives negative thing this this wondrous giant machine they've made inevitably just can't be explained or just can't yeah. answer certain things but i found those little beats so interesting because especially think you know james credit to james marsden and Evan rachel wood for for playing those moments so well especially marsden in that moment because he looks so lost and at the same time like like you described it really well he goes into like almost like a passive like waiting to receive yeah. directive kind of state and it was really interesting because they're so living breathing and vibrant aside from that and and uh I, i'm just really want to know more about that yeah it'll be interesting to kind of track through the show to see if they start stepping over their own rules in a way to see if there's any contradictions in the way that these things operate and this whether or not that is what they're intending to do this is such a time yeah that's true and this is such a timely conversation in general just based on the fact that we recently watched uh, memento yeah and i was talking about one of my favorite things about christopher nolan is his ability to cover his tracks yep. and to 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 tell you the loopholes and and explain away any doubts you may have in terms of the, the story and how it works and so whether or not uh and jonathan is certainly to credit for that also being being the more of the writer of the two in a yeah. way uh, and I, I like that that will probably migrate its way over over here. And 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 uh, I like to think also maybe some of Jonathan's uh, uh, memento was his his original story. Yeah. Obviously, I like that this is kind of dealing in ways with a similar theme that you these some of these hosts are coming across people that know them but they can't place who they are and how yeah. we are going to watch them try to react in a, in in a way that will benefit them. And I think we'll probably, based on how this episode ends, we're probably going to start to see the level of predictability of, of how these hosts react start to decrease. And there's going to be a little more improvisation yeah. or a little more, you know, off off script. Is that what they keep saying? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It, it That'll that'll definitely be interesting to see. I'm kind of interested to see. I want to learn a little bit more. One of the things that this show really, uh, it felt like a cross between Groundhog Day and Dollhouse, Joss Whedon's Dollhouse in the sense of like, being able to be rich and pay for somebody or people to act the way you want them to or or to even embody a person or gain a personality that that you want to spend time with and so i'm interested in seeing how much the guests can be like well you know i want to buy this package that allows them to remember me from the last time i was here and seeing how that even functions and if that kind of programming um like modular programming or something is something that they account for in this theme park. Cause we, I mean, you know, obviously if, if at all, if at all. Yeah. Cause the man in black has been coming for 30 years and no one, no one well, remembers the, him, but does he want them to kind or? of the big, th I don't think so. He, he has a line about that too. Doesn't he? Where he says, I, uh, well, he wants people to be upset. By yeah, him. that's true. And, yeah. uh, the, uh, I keep forgetting size more. Uh, mentions that he actually wants to make it even simpler. He said part of the part of the allure of the hosts was that people knew they people were people know fake. that they're robots. Yeah, and he's like, you know, do do we want people to necessarily know that they're you know having sex with these things and killing them, or do they want to feel like they're doing that to real people, or would they rather feel like they're doing that to robots? And yeah. That was part of the kind of guilty pleasure of the movie is that they're very they're very animatronic and kind of clunky yeah and so when they'd shoot one they would like laugh and go ah that was fun and mm -hmm. it's like going to the carnival and just shooting some little tin cans and then collecting your teddy bear and walking away yeah and in this it's like it's so eerily close to real people that it's yeah. like it's much more sick there's it's twisted. like a you're kind of they're kind of like living in that uncanny valley between mm -hmm. real life and and that that's very interesting so we open up on uh, some the the guests who accepted the uh, bandit hunting job. They they stumble across some dead bodies, and uh, the sheriff is talking to the guests when a fly lands on him and he starts kind of seizing, and and kind of acting strange. So the the guests head back into town, and then back in the lab, uh, Bernard is is studying the uh, the sheriff who had had malfunctioned. And he kind of says, all right, well, 10% of these hosts were updated to the latest software that has these reveries that are potentially causing this issue. And the operations leader, Cullen, wants to pull all 10%, but the narrative director, Sizemore, uh, as you've been referring to, 
uh, explains that that would be catastrophic for the narrative and for the guests that are currently staying at the park. Um, so they don't, they kind of come to a standstill there. Uh, Teddy's guests at the whorehouse or the, the brothel talk about how Teddy creeps them out a little bit, but they might use him, uh, as some kind of bait or, or, or just to kind of like target shoot practice. him up, target practice, yeah. that kind of thing. Uh, and that, and, and that is where we see some of that passive state that mm-hmm. we're talking about. He's just like kind of sitting outside mode. of their room. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we cut to Dolores, who's painting kind of in this little creek or ravine or something, like kind of river area. And a younger family walks up with a child, and uh, she takes them to go see these horses. And I found it kind of cool that the horses are coded to be very like, engaging sociable. and sociable. <laughs> yeah. um, so she helps the child feed them an apple, and he says... Uh, he asks if she's one of them, but she doesn't really get it and doesn't know how to respond. So as you said, she she tells him to get back before dark and there's bandits out and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we cut to Dolores' father tending to his herd when he finds a photograph uh, in, in the dirt. And I don't think we get to see the photograph at this moment as of yet, right? It's the next scene. Yeah, the next yeah. scene. Basically, there's a woman standing on what looks like a New York street out in Times Square or something like mm-hmm. that. Uh, and it was buried outside of his cattle pen. Dolores comes home and and she takes a look at it, at it, but she doesn't comprehend what it is. She doesn't really. She's like, it doesn't look like anything to me. Whereas he seems kind of completely enraptured by that picture. Um, so that's the end of that act, so to speak. Uh, any thoughts on the stuff that I just brought up? We kind of covered most of it in our last little discussion break. Yeah, but I think so. all right, so. Uh, on to the next set, we've got uh, Sizemore, Lee Sizemore, as he's known, comes to see Teresa Cullen, that's her name, the operation leader, to suggest that the host shouldn't be updated because the visitors want to know that the that the robots are robots, which I thought was a pretty good, uh, it, it was an interesting conversation that they mm-hmm. had. Uh, Sizemore tells Cullen that he would support her if Ford dies or leaves, but she argues that he has no idea what's actually going on. Uh, in the sense that the guests and the shareholders and the management are all invested into this park for very different reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he's essentially useless to her. Um, and so that seemed like it, it, that's the first suggestion that there's even uh, motives beyond the theme park. Some sort of conspiracy. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. even like w- it, forget what like the shareholders are maybe they're just to make money or whatever like what does the management really want to do i don't know but i'm excited to find out uh we cut to the player piano gun it's playing black hole sun Mm -hmm. by soundgarden what did you think about that i was wondering in this in the sense was this song really diegetic or non-diegetic like is it actually happening in the theme park because nicole was even like that's that seems weird. Like, isn't this supposed to feel accurate? Like, w- what what were your thoughts on, on hearing that? I assumed it was actually playing in the bar. Yeah, because we of, see the player piano yeah, wheel up. It kind of had that vibe. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's 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 actually, it was one of the first questions I wrote down. Yeah. I haven't really spent too much time to think about it. And I actually spent almost the entire scene trying to place it. Because yeah, it me pl- too. It was playing, and I, I barely even listened to the dialogue yep. going on between the bartender and the, the Pharaoh dealer. Because I was, I was just listening to this. I was like, what song is that? <laughs> and uh, my girlfriend and I both at the same time were like, it's Black Hole Sun. But I, I don't know. I mean, Black Hole Sun is a very interesting, trippy song with a really interesting, trippy music video. And yeah. There's something very haunting and, and, and unnerving about, about the whole thing. So it playing felt really suitable. But I, I'm sure there's a deeper meaning that I haven't even discovered yet yeah i mean uh, but part of me wonders if it's just kind of like a like a thing that gets slipped into the west world to kind of show people to show the guests that they're still like in like this isn't necessarily the wild west but right. it's our creation of the mm-hmm. wild west i don't really know exactly what it means yet so if you guys out there listening have any ideas or thoughts about it let us know westworld fm at gmail.com but uh yeah so then um, the barkeeper, the saloon owner, whatever he is, displays kind of uh, Native American racism to the dealer as the dealer leaves for the day. He's checking him for checking his pockets because he knows he's a half corn, corn husker. 
and he asks him he doesn't know which half it is and then the dealer says the half that's gonna cut your throat is what he whispers under his breath but then uh he gets his throat slit by the man in black as he gets dragged away and then we cut back to elsie telling bernard that there's a serious problem with one of the hosts and one of the bandits that attacked the abernathy farm uh has basically started randomly killing other hosts in front of guests walter walter is his name mm-hmm. uh so walter's killing a bunch of guests or killing a bunch of hosts in front of the guests <laughs> not the guests yet and he's got a weird obsession with milk he's got a very strange obsession with milk um and so i don't really know if we're supposed to comprehend the situation because it's not like they do either but i did want to note that the cleanup crew kind of appears out of nowhere, which yeah. I felt was like a very cool kind of uh, just a little display of like the we can just show up and clean up the situation and mm-hmm. then get out of here. I thought that was sweet. It is really cool. Be- better than they do in the movie with these dudes <laughs> wheeling like a huge street light out. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, uh, I really liked I really liked the scene. It was really horrifying and really creepy. And he was. Uh, talking about it now made me realize we didn't really talk about it earlier when it happens. Yeah. Uh, that they, it, it seems to make sense narratively at the first time, but then at the same time, you're kind of like, well, what? Because they seem surprised by it that that, that these, that the Abernathy farm got attacked. Yeah, and he says this, all they have is milk, too. Yeah, and it's the same, it's the same hosts. Yeah. Except this time, Walter has also killed a mustache guy who, yeah. was, who was one of the ones there before. This scene raised another question for me, which is when do they know that they're dead? Like, how do the hosts die? Yeah. I think is it is it it must be programmed then that if you receive X amount of wounds, you are going to die because like Teddy gets shot once and he like goes down. And at this point, like he must be dead. But Walter's still standing there and he's got holes in him and he's drinking milk and milk just dripping out of There must be like a, like a vitality. Like they must know which organs are vital and... Maybe, but my the question that it kind of raised for me was whatever infection or virus that is working its way around or whatever sort of abnormality is happening, is it overriding their you're dead yeah. instinct? That could be some of their programming going on. Right, haywire, that's kind of yeah. what I'm wondering because if these if they start to try to put these hosts down and they're not responding because they don't think they're dead, yeah. it's uh, it's going to be bad news. <laughs> yeah. This scene I was watching and I was like, oh shit. Like he's <laughs> clearly been lit up by some of these other guys, but he's just drinking milk and doesn't care. Yeah, And uh, the, the shot of the two guests like huddled in the corner, in the corner oh, yeah, yeah. It was so good. I really like uh, the Elder Hemsworth. I already forgot his name. Luke. Call him uh, Andrew. Ashley is the name. Of the, is his name in the show? Okay. Uh, I really like that character. I like his. I like that we've. I like that we're getting these these personalities. We've got the narrative guy. We've got the operations. We've got the programming. We've got. He's kind of like security almost. Yeah. And I really like that we're getting all these different angles. And, yeah. And the different are, departments interfacing. Right. Yeah. And I really like the. I like the scenes of watching them have to work with each other and against each other and. Uh, did we? I don't think we got to the scene yet where Jeffrey Wright is talking about her micro expressions, but it's really no, good. not yet. That's okay. that's about to come up. So anyway, uh, I, thought, I I agree with you though. That was really cool how they're just boom, they're there. Like floodlights come on and they're and everything freezes and they're kind of checking out the scene. It was almost like a crime scene show for a second, <laughs> yeah. but like way more engaging. <laughs> yeah, it was very that that was one of my favorite moments of the of the premiere. But um, so the anomaly proves that there's something up with the update basically according according to bernard bernard figures that this is another these these are more hosts that have been updated and he knows that there's something weird going on with them because of all these cases that are popping up uh but cullen wants to kind of just pull the defective ones out of the park completely and put them on the shelf put them down in storage um but they decide to basically pull all of them in one go and check them one by one uh after some kind of big narrative event um bernard tells ford about this issue at the behest of Colin and kind of the plan to fix it. And he says that the reveries in Ford's code are what are causing the issue. Um, and then Anthony Hopkins, Hopkins has kind of this little, not monologue, but some, some talk. He talks a little bit about evolution and how evolution forged the entirety of sent, sentient life using only one tool, the mistake. And, and he says, uh, you know, you'll have to forgive me a few mistakes. Um, so he has another great line in that scene too that really popped 
out to me recently. The well, the idea that once we resurrect the dead, we are done as We're, humans. We've maxed out. Yeah. Yeah, is, which is we can't get any better. Considering the thematic elements of the show, the idea that maybe these hosts will turn and you know subjugate the humans in some way, potentially, who knows? Uh, I think that was a, a salient point for him to make. Um, yeah, I think I must have skipped over the 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 little micro expression moment between Jeffrey Wright and the operations woman but um that was very it's when they're it's when they're they're talking about the sheriff yeah it's the first time that it comes up with the sheriff basically she has this little micro expression that jeffrey wright notices because he looks at these things and he programs them and he's aware of them (laughs) and he like is basically just like hey can i record that and she's like no and he's like oh you're doing it again (laughs) because she's angry with him he's like when you're when you're angry and you're trying to keep it in uh, you do that. Uh, yeah, the muscles above your... Yeah, yeah. like at your brow. Yeah, yep. it was really funny. That was very cool. But uh, so basically this conversation between Ford and, and uh, Bernard, uh, it, what does it make you feel? Like to me, we're clear, uh, obviously it's the premiere of the show. We're not seeing all of Ford's cards. Yeah, I I really like... I really like my my read and my vibes on Ford so far that he's an old man who who is just kind of he feels like he's disconnected from his creation. Yeah, but though. I have a feeling he's he's got a lot to do with kind pushing of, with like kind a of what's agenda. going on. Yeah, I would love to be able to at the end of the series be able to be like, oh, that sweet Mister Ford, chilling down in the morgue area with old Bill, just wants to have a drink and talk about the good old days. But it feels like there's more going on. Yeah, with him, and I don't know what yet. And I I really. I like the relationship between him and Bernard. I think that they, the other department heads seem a little fed up with Ford. And yeah. I, I like that there's that Bernard has kind of a soft spot for him because they're the most alike. They're, they're both programmers. Yeah. And I think that watching those two interact throughout the series is going to be a lot of well, fun. Well, Bernard kind of feels like a protege mm-hmm. in the sense of like, there's, there's all kinds, of, I don't know if anybody read Reddit at this point, but there's all kinds of theories about like who in the command center is actually a host or a robot. Mm. But you could maybe get the sense that Bernard is the closest thing to an actual son that Ford has or, or like that kind of protege relationship, whereas all of the hosts are like his his mechanical creations, his sons in that in that respect. So that'll be interesting to kind of see where those... It is true. We've gotten we've gotten hints at the personal lives of at least three of the other department heads. Yeah. Cullen, yeah, she's asked by Sizemore when she's rotating out. It kind of implies that they they work there twenty four seven for six to twelve months or something like that, yeah. and then leave again. And Sizemore seems to know about that, so he seems to have some sort of outside life, maybe. And then uh, Mister Hemsworth talks. He asks the question about the, do you have children at home, that kind of thing. And Bernard is like, no. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. There's a there's a lot of unknowns about all these people and i'm taking them at face value but well and the other thing the other thing is is that we do see a moment where bernard is looking at a photo of a child or something Mm. which doesn't quite line up with that but who knows what the relationship could be like a chief hopper moment of maybe asking about his daughter and then someone else says oh she died yep yeah so all right, uh, we open again on the man in black having drained Kissy's blood, uh, and he plans to get some answers out of Kissy. Uh, the man in black says that he's in Westworld to play the game, but he knows that there's a deeper level, and he's going to dig deeper into Kissy to learn more about this game. Then we see Dolores waking up once again. She walks downstairs and sees her dad and and asks him how he's doing or what what uh, you know, and then she realize he doesn't say anything to her. And she asks him if he's been up all night. So then her father, Peter, starts to stutter, but he kind of snaps out of it to tell her that she needs to leave. And he says, hell is empty and all the devils are here. And then he whispers something in her ear and Dolores runs to get a doctor because she thinks that he's like feverish or something like that. Um, so Dolores makes it to town and Teddy's there and he sees her and uh, he runs out to help her out. But they see Hector roll into town and they're just kind of like, well, we probably need to, we can't really go anywhere. We got to hide out at the moment. Um, and then we pull back to the control room. We hear that Sizemore has changed the narrative to bring the outlaw to town earlier in order to use it as a way to switch out the hosts. 
and he gave the robber an upgraded speech. And uh, and so basically they're going to use this opportunity to kill, quote unquote, the 10 percent uh, of of hosts and then pull them all from the game, from the, the theme park so they can investigate them that way. So Dolores, uh, in the middle of the firefight that's going on, because Hector pulls up and starts shooting up the saloon, and the his guys run in to get the safe. Dolores runs out to get back to her father, but Teddy chases after her, and he ends up getting fatally wounded. He pulls out his line saying, don't mind me, just trying to look chivalrous. Oh, it's great. It's, ba- it's like the death scene from Team America. <laughs> it's so funny. James Marsden is so funny in this, and it's I don't think it's meant to be funny, but he's just... He's so earnest that... It, oh, it's adorable. Yeah. It's hilarious. Yep. And he, uh, <laughs> I mean, Siri, if, if you've seen Team America, right? It's been a while, but yeah. right at the beginning of the movie, when like the the main woman's husband or or whatever dies, and he has the most drawn out death <laughs> scene with full chalk full of those one liners, like looks like it's a one way ticket, babe. That kind of stuff. It's exactly that scene. It's so yeah. funny. It's like all all the western tropes are just shoved into James Marsden's character. It's yeah, really really funny to watch. He's he's out. the the young cowboy mm-hmm. in the in the story. Uh, so the robbers pull the safe from the saloon, and Hector has a line to Thandy Newton's character. I forget what her name is. I have it here somewhere. Uh, Maeve? M- Maeve? 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 M-A-E-V-E? Maeve. I think they call her Maeve. Uh, Hector says to Maeve, no matter how dirty the business, do it well. They kind of have the same uh, work ethic is, is his, his word to her. Um, so... Basically, they they say that they're going to rob the saloon because he knows that they it's it's a bit of a brothel and that they obviously have money in that kind of business. Uh, and then the safe gets whisked out of there by the horse, and uh, two guests walk up right as as Hector is about to give his speech, and they shoot him in the neck and then shoot his right hand woman as well. Uh, and they very grossly react to the situation. I don't I, like it's it's so much of a it's what you were saying earlier about the idea that they're just kind of like oh look at this terrible thing that we've done this is great you it's know like Dennis shooting a lion I paid all this money <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> ripped from today's headlines uh but yeah it's that's it, it's such a it's a little on the nose but I really appreciate it for how gross they play it. Yeah, I think sometimes that's just the way you got to go with that sat- satiric element. Yeah. Just take it. Yep. So obviously Sizemore gets disappointed that we don't get to hear. That's really funny. Hear the hear Hector's says, speech. Maybe you'll get to it tomorrow. Yeah, may- maybe next time. Uh, wh- what, did, what did you think about uh, Rodrigo Santoro? Oh, he's great. He's it's, so good. It's really, f- it's really, again, it's really funny casting because Rodrigo Santoro frequently gets cast as this perfect, perfect man. Yeah. It's like his kind of go-to thing now like ah it's like the anthony hopkins type we need a we need a tall handsome dark alluring stranger <laughs> a rodrigo santoro type okay because <laughs> and it, it cracks me up because the two noteworthy examples i think of he plays xerxes in 300 who's supposed to be this like giant perfect man god and then he is laura lenny's love interest in love actually mm. and it's so funny because he's kind of a nerd in that movie he's kind of <laughs> this like bespeckled meek kind of dork but she's like obsessed with him and it's really funny to watch that that their interactions play out too. That's a great movie. That's yeah. another story for another day. But Rodrigo Santoro is just funny. It's like it's like it would have been like casting Antonio Banderas in this part like ten years ago. Yep. You just need or, or like a Clooney and yeah. for that type of role. It's like really funny. Yeah. But he's great. It's a great scene. It's a great introduction. It's a really cool shootout. I mean, I, I love the the rolling out of the like the almost like the giant tool roll up filled with guns that are already loaded mm-hmm. and uh, just proceeding to just wipe out everybody on the street is really cool yeah i think uh armistice is the name I, we didn't get the name but the his his right hand woman who just lights up the town oh yeah it's is, great it's awesome to see her just kill everybody and I, I like that relationship too where he's very much kind of the gang boss where he can handle himself but he'd rather go in and pour himself a drink and watch his team do their work and like flirt with sandy newton and then yeah. and i love the part where he moves her aside for the safe to fall down it's just very it's very fun, kind of Jack Sparrow, kind of swashbuckling thieves. Bit yeah, of. and and the banter and the 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 chemistry between him and Thandi Newton is great. I yeah. love Thandi Newton too; she's awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, you haven't seen Rock and Rolla, but no, she's I have not. so 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 good in that movie, and in a way, a similar character. It's kind of neat, but the and it's funny because I'm watching this whole scene unfold, and I got so swept up in it, and I was like, 
it's just code ex- <laughs> executing itself. That's part of the beauty of yeah. it. Is like it's just this is decided what would happen, and it's just it's magnificent. It, and and I will say it's it's one of those things like thinking about the happenstance of it all. The show did such a good job of making me. It's like the feeling that you get when you watch The Matrix for the first time. Like, man, is this happening? Like, mm-hmm. is that is that is this what is real? And then even in this show, like the idea that the whenever a diagnostic is being done to these robots, they're dreaming. It makes me think, man, when I have a dream, what's going on? Am I talking to my creator? Like, I love those little things that kind of creep into my brain as I'm watching the show. It's one oh, of it raises a lot of very poignant questions, especially with uh, fairly recently, maybe within the last month or so. Elon Musk, I think, was the one talking about it. About yeah. Whether or not we're, there's a good chance we're living in a simulation. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. What do you say, like an 11% yeah, chance? Yeah, there's like the, the calculations out there. Like, it's, it's a pretty sizable probability that we are a simulation. <laughs> Or, or if not a simulation and the, an experiment being observed yeah. from afar, and, I, and it, watching this show, it is kind of like it's great. And I was kind of at the end, I was like, like ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I would rather be the Rodrigo Santoro <laughs> in the simulation. He's good. At, I guess not with how the scene ends for him, though. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. That's He'll be fair. back though. Yeah, absolutely. I guess I'm probably the. I really liked the. Uh, the end of that scene too where they they kind of stood him up yeah it's like pose for pictures it reminds me of like um is it i don't think it no it wasn't that long i'm trying to remember there's some famous outlaw that they did basically the same thing where yeah they, they propped and that was pretty common i think back in, then, the, but in like, the wild west but like yeah. when like noteworthy like wild bills and that sort of thing and billy the kids would get caught they would prop them up like that and like <laughs> there was a room of like 40 dudes taking a picture with a body and it's so yeah. weird <laughs> yeah. it's so weird they're like look what we did and i got a picture with billy the kid and that kind of as if he's uh, like a big fucking swordfish <laughs> on the end of a line like look what we yeah. caught <laughs> oh boy absolutely yeah um all right so we see dolores uh there for Teddy's death, essentially she's staying by his side, but she asks Elsie, who is there in costume, uh, to take care of him while he while she goes to take care of her dad. But Elsie puts her to sleep, uh, and then we see that uh, the ten percent that got upgraded, we're we're back at the Westworld Labs. Uh, Bernard tells uh, Colin that most of them are all good except for one, and that would be Dolores's father, Peter. Uh, and then we cut to Ashley giving the same diagnostic query to Dolores as Jeffrey Wright is doing in the beginning of the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to go back and compare the differences at some point to see where things line up and they don't. Because obviously this time she gets to talk about her dad because they ask if anybody in her life has seem to question their reality and she mentions her father and talks about what went on there and they ask her about the picture like they ask her about the photo weird and yeah and she's just she says no and that kind of thing so uh it it seemed interesting to me of like why did that switch like it caught me off guard when when it was luke hemsworth asking the questions instead of jeffrey wright because i was like the part at the beginning of the show is that from something previous that happened or like what like i would imagine there's a chronological game kind of being played with us exactly so i i don't know exactly how that worked out but i i'm interested to to learn more about it um and then we get to see uh colin basically being like all right well this guy is defective we got to put him on the shelf but then ford says well maybe we should learn why he or what's going on here Mm-hmm. so ford uh basically sits down with mr abernathy asks him questions and things like uh you know tell me what your purpose is and that kind of stuff what's your name uh so uh, in the first instance he's like peter's basically blubbering and and stuttering as he was previously but then ford calls him back to peter abernathy he kind of tells him to go back to your previous incarnation mm-hmm. so it's almost like Something happened even while he was in Westworld to push him into a new incarnation. So uh, he calls him back to Peter and uh, asks him what his purpose is in life. And then he starts talking. But as soon as he gets to Dolores, he starts breaking up again and kind of like he starts saying, oh, I have to warn her. The things they do to her, the things you do to her. Uh, he, He kind of he's weirdly aware of the repetitive nature and 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 what westworld is 
Yes. And we don't really know why. Uh, so Ford calls him back to his quote unquote current build and asks his name, but Peter starts reciting Shakespeare instead. And uh, when he's asked his itinerary, he says, to meet my maker. And uh, he says, by most mechanical and dirty hand, I shall have such revenges on you both, looking at uh, Ford and Bernard. Uh, so Bernard doesn't really realize that, oh, that he's off script. But then Ford kind of realizes, oh, we've had him in multiple roles. He's been Peter Abernathy. He's been... He was a sheriff briefly. Yeah, he was a sheriff, and then he's also been the professor in some kind of murder uh, mystery uh, thing where uh, he... And he was a cult leader. He was a cult leader yeah. who ends up, like, leading cannibals. Cannibals, in, yeah. yeah. So, um... <laughs> it reminds me of Fallout at that point, for some reason. Yeah, it's kind of... <laughs> like, the way a lot of character models feel very similar in Fallout, but they play, like, very different roles. Yeah, yeah. And they have these weird side adventures where one is a leader of a cannibal cult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that i it, guess could s- just happen upon <laughs> this now you're making me want a westworld video game really bad <laughs> that would be cool but uh so basically uh they shut peter down and uh they don't really understand exactly what's going on but uh bernard and ford kind of put it together that he can somehow access all of these past uh lives of his through his reveries or his his little flourishes that they've programmed into him with this with this whole update um so then we cut back to ashley asking uh what peter had whispered to dolores and he says to dolores these violent delights have the have violent ends which seems interesting um and she doesn't know what that means, but she says that she still says to him that she wouldn't hurt a living thing. And Peter ends up getting decommissioned. They kind of screw something into his nose or something like that. Do you know what was going on with that? Uh, I don't. Yeah. I it it I guess the decommissioning process has things that we don't know necessarily yet, but um, Yeah, it reminded me of like a, an old lobotomy type situation yeah they used to hammer and chisel yeah uh, like the bone right up at the top of the bridge of your nose Mm -hmm. do something into your brain and make basically make you into a vegetable yeah um and then we cut back to dolores with her uh we see uh, ashley kind of reveals that dolores is the oldest host in the park and has been repaired so many times that she's practically new we see her day start over once again, and she is there with a new father in place. The bartender. Yeah. The former bartender. Yeah, former bartender is now her father with a gigantic mustache. Oh, yeah. That's great. Uh, Peter and one of the earlier robbers, uh, you called him something with a W. Walter. Walter, yeah. Peter and Robert get decommissioned at the same time because they both obviously uh, messed up pretty bad. Um, and Bernard whispers something into Peter's ear as he walks into storage, which we don't know as of yet. Uh, the man in black has Kissy's scalp, which looks like it has some kind of symbol or map or something inside of it. And then finally a fly lands on Dolores's neck and she ends up killing it. So lots to unpack there. Mm -hmm. Do you have anywhere in particular that you want to start? Yes. Where would that be? Is it in Westworld? Lewis, Lewis Hertham is the name of the actor who plays Mr. Abernathy. Yeah. Give him the <laughs> Emmy now. <laughs> Immediately. Immediately. There's no debate. It's insane what this guy does in the span of one scene. That whole diagnostic scene is absolutely incredible. Yeah. The level, the, the, just the gymnastics that his face <laughs> is doing and his voice and, and everything. I mean, it's it's phenomenal. Yeah. It's just top 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 notch work. And I think that it's it's weird for a guy like me who's so into the production aspect of of movies and TV to be so transfixed by the acting, but it's that good. Mm-hmm. And in that scene, especially when dealing with characters like this that are supposed to be artificial or synthetic and making them feel real. And just watching Anthony Hopkins just recall him from personality to personality to personality and watching this guy's face and voice and body language and posture change is just amazing. Yeah. It was incredible stuff. And I can't 
imagine how much fun it was to try to cast that role and try to find somebody who could convey all these different who could literally feel like by the end of that, I was like is he real is that guy on IMDb <laughs> or what or is he is he just totally fake no it was incredible and I hope that he comes back like if that if this is the only episode that guy's in I'm gonna be bummed out because he's phenomenal I really love that idea too that the these hosts are just being cycled in and out because it's so funny because we've 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 kind of like run the little run we've seen that same opening of her getting up in bed and coming down the stairs going to the porch at least three or four times by this point and we've gotten so accustomed to that being her dad and when we see like mustached bartender there instead it's so funny because we we are privy to what's going on here but you could see you could see a guest rolling by and not as not not even knowing like oh there she is there's her dad cool that's who they are and she doesn't know any better he doesn't know any better it it's just another theme in this show the way that these people can constantly be just interchangeable and have their minds or their memories i guess wiped yeah. and not even know it's just so sad and so yeah. so amazing but the uh everything going on with that scene that felt like threats to bernard and mr ford they didn't feel like just recycled dialogue no it felt very real it felt assembled in a way yes. it might have been old dialogue but it felt assembled in a way in a very purposeful way to tell them that mm -hmm. something's coming yes it was very cool it was a great scene it was very intense and i was like oh god they're gonna kill anthony hopkins in this first episode aren't they I thought for sure <laughs> yeah i was like oh god he's gone <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly i thought we were gonna have a blade runner moment on our hands there yeah not yet uh the the only other real bit from that that left me really kind of scratching my head was uh wondering what exactly the man in black is up to what's his end game and what how's he going about it how does he know to do the things he's doing yeah so there's kind of things uh on the internet just kind of d trying to figure out what he is and most people are thinking that he's some kind of like corporate spy almost in the sense of like maybe he's working for a competing uh theme park or ai designer or android maker or something to try and learn more about how these things actually work um but i don't i don't know how much i buy that part of me still wants him to be a host somehow who has magically uh, yeah i don't know. trick the system into thinking that he's not or like it it just i don't know it, it'll it be very interesting to see what the man in black actually is and i was wondering if you had any thoughts being such a stephen king uh stephen king fan the idea that he's the man in black. Right, yeah. W w instead of the gunslinger. Yeah, or <laughs> instead of the yeah. gunslinger. It's just no, kind of like it's what... Funny. Like it, it <laughs> that did cross my mind. Yeah. If there had been a character tracking him, that'd be hilarious. I would have been like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is borderline... Maybe next episode. Borderline infringement. <laughs> Somebody's going to hop in. Yeah. I think... I thought there was a character credited as the gunslinger. Oh, no. Uh, James Marsden, I think, is referred to as gunslinger by another character. Oh. But we know his name. Yeah. Uh Oh, that would be funny if James Mars ended up trying to track down the man in black. That'd be cool. The uh it feels to me like he's trying to find the command center, and I don't know yeah. why. I don't know why I think that. Well uh, Because I, it it, do, it does look like a map. It looks like a symbol, but it also kind of weirdly looks like a map. And the way he looks at it is almost in reference to like, okay, am I going the right way? Or, well uh, well part of me is like, why would they put a map on the scalp <laughs> of <laughs> But if it is a game Maybe. Uh, yeah. Who knows? Is he Will he be the winner? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. But that, yeah, that's kind of the thing. Is like if he makes it to there, what are they gonna do? Like, what does he think is gonna happen? Like, I don't know. Yeah, because it's it's weirdly, the whole command center is is weirdly positioned in Westworld. It's at yeah. the top of like a bluff, and uh, I I got the vibe from early on with the the kind of three D map that they were somewhere Elsewhere, else or like yeah. above it, like almost like kind of like a Truman Show kind of dome, and they're like up. In, in the, the rafters, in, yeah. Ed Harris is going to reprise his role. There. <laughs> but that's kind of the vibe I got. And and it, initially, I w right away when my when my girlfriend was asking me a couple things about it, she's like, "So what's kind of the what's kind of the gist of the show?" And I, I just straight up was like, "I don't know." <laughs> I said, "I could tell you what the movie's about, but yeah. I don't think that the show is necessarily going to follow it to a suit." But I, she said, "Is it is the park in?" the real world or it like is it somewhere in some sequestered area and i said i would imagine what we're, we're seeing is like an artificial sun and an artificial environment and the, interesting the show doesn't really commit either way yeah. which is really interesting but the uh yeah i don't know what he's after but i'm i am very intrigued i'm yeah. i'm almost more intrigued by that mystery than what what ford's up to or what 
you know what maybe if there is a deeper meaning to the reveries i'm not yeah. sure there are there are obviously a lot of questions and i um i think we answered most of the ones i had written down or we talked about them at least the only other question i really had and i think it gets answered by the end is is there only one of each is each one unique so yeah. i begin to wonder is each james marsden is there only one is there one dolores is there one teddy do they yeah and it seems that way by the end when they get you know when we see uh mr abernathy get decommissioned and that sort of thing but the uh it made me curious because I'm like, how often do they get, when do they get fixed? You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, what's the average work day at Westworld <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a park employee, so to speak? Or, how do they repair all these things overnight? Oh, yeah, because they're getting shot a lot. Yeah. Or do they just, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, Yeah, and, it's I, and I think from that earlier interview that I was talking about with uh, Slash Film, I think Jonathan kind of said that some more of the world building those rules and operations kind of things will be in episode two the behind so, the scenes yeah like it just just a little bit more context about how the world works will will come later but he was more focused in this episode on making you empathetic towards sure. the and, that, and that makes total sense and it, it actually in our in our primer episode where we're talking about the movie i said that the stuff i liked the most was a lot of the behind the scene the yeah. park operations stuff was really fun yep and i think that i i'm equally compelled by by anything in this show everything is really interesting there's nothing that i don't want to see more of yep absolutely so overall i'd say we both enjoyed it quite a bit yeah i think uh without knowing too much about the show i guess we we kind of said in the primer episode also that we thought this would only focus there would only be one world it's west world yeah and that i'm glad that came to pass there's we can focus solely on uh, unless they reveal in the end. That well, they could. I mean, if they say, "Oh shit!" In like episode ten, like there's actually two or three other worlds going on. That, that would be pretty wild. It's possible. It could come later on. I mean, I, and that's one of the things. Uh, HBO is obviously bet pretty big on this show. I think they've spent like a hundred million dollars or something on this season alone. They want another hit because Game of Thrones is getting near to the end of its run. Sure. So uh, obviously, they want to have a long term storyline to kind of tell with this show. The only other question I have, and, I, and I'm going to ask you as well. Okay. What do you think was the whisper from Bernard to Mr. Abernathy? And maybe not even what do you think it was, but what do you think it meant? Or what, yeah. Is it, is it just, is it I think nothing s- more than just, hey, go stand in row 50. See you later. Some of me thinks uh, it's almost an ex machina situation of like Bernard's the one that could be the the opening in the armor for the the hosts in the sense of like he's the one that's going to be empathetic enough to these creations of like god these are people and things too and they have feelings and all that maybe he's the one that that is the vulnerability for them to be able to perpetrate for for the host to be able to perpetrate whatever they're going to do to these people but I, I don't like you said, I don't know. It's, it's not. Yeah, it's interesting because although although they are very, very lifelike, obviously, at the end of the day, they can still be turned off by just a sentence. Yeah. So they haven't crossed that line into like Blade Runner. Not yet. You cannot control them. Yep. Yeah. Un- unless, through, unless through violence, which is uh, which, you know, that there's a difference. Yeah. And in this show. I, I mean, I, I think we will sort of, sort of start to see an evolution of what the hosts are capable of. Yeah. But the the only... I, I've read a lot of really positive things about this so far. It seems to be being received very well. I think so, too. Yeah. I'm glad it is also by us. Yeah. Because uh, we both obviously really liked Preacher. Uh-huh. And uh, you can go back and listen to that. And yeah, Gone to Texas, a podcast about AMC's Preacher. Check it out in iTunes, Stitcher, and all that good stuff. But for some reason, I was a little nervous about this one. Yeah. Because the source material is so... <laughs> I don't want to say it's it, like we said in, in the primer. It's just it's a wealth of potential, not necessarily yeah. executed well, but the idea is amazing. And so you've got this incredible premise, and you've got this slew of stupidly good actors, and yeah. you've got a lot of talent behind the camera in the writing room. There's so much good stuff coming together that I was scared. I was like, and, oh. well, and we had production delays. This got delayed almost. Almost a whole year, I think. Mm. I think it was supposed to come out last fall. It was supposed to come out a long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah, and then they were like, oh, hold the brakes. We're going to take another year to do something. Yeah, well, good. So far, so good. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm really glad it starts off so well. Yeah. The only criticism I read leveled at it was, and it was a little, it was a little whiny, but uh, was that 
the show is focusing too much on asking us big questions and drawing our attention towards big conspiracies and big mysteries rather than getting into the themes of what it means to be human, that sort of thing. And we even if you're a reviewer, you've had four episodes to watch. Like we give the show some time, right? That that's true. I, I understand the criticism, but we've got a lot of I think we have a lot of movies and T V that do explore that idea and do yeah. it and do it well. It's not an unexplored theme. That's true. And I would I think the show will get there. It already is starting to get there. We're already getting and a lot of it is what you bring to the table, I think, as a viewer, Absolutely. obviously. Like we said, just talking about Memento, uh, this is kind of fresh in my mind anyway, this idea of you know even your memory or what it means to, to be sure of what you know or what you don't know and the, how often do you question your existence question they keep giving during the diagnostic. Yeah. And I, I can understand that that concern, I guess. Why not, not being afraid of like a lost type situation. Yeah. No, Where our show is well, throwing these big crazy looming questions at you but i don't i don't think it's oversaturated i think there's a few key big ones but overall nothing offensive yeah and in terms of the slider between answering questions and leaving them open with answering questions at the at at a rapid pace being like cwdc shows and at a slow pace or never pace being lost i think we're gonna be somewhere in the middle a never pace i I think it's gonna be somewhere in the middle there but i do feel as though by some point we will i think at the end of this season we will have some of those questions answered or on their way to being answered yeah so i i'm not as worried about that but i do think some of like you need to do Thematic material is so subjective in a lot of ways that I think you need to be the one that puts a lot of emphasis and thought into it. Otherwise, people like you and me are going to be like, God, that was so on the nose, you know? So I think there's a lot to chew on. I'm excited that the show has that. And one other thing I forgot to mention early on that kind of brings me back around to to kind of like you're saying what you what you get out of it might might also have to do with what you bring to it or how you view it. Um, I I could be getting it wrong, but I I because I, I my girlfriend and I were talking really briefly during the the opening scene on the train when James Marsden first first wakes up when we first meet him. Yep. And the guys sitting in front of him, like he's the newcomers, are talking, and I think one of them asks the other, uh, like what he did, la- what he's what did you do here. last time? Yeah, yeah. And the one says, "Oh, one time I was here. I did the whole experience. I did the gold rush, that kind of thing." And then I think he says his next time through he did straight evil. Yeah, almost as though it was like his playthrough. Like, yeah, and I think, I think that's really interesting. Well, and one of the thing when I was reading that slash film interview, Lisa Joy, who's also Nolan's wife, I believe, Jonathan Nolan's wife. Okay. Um, I think she uh, she was talking about the idea that these hosts are kind of NPCs in a video game. Mm-hmm. So I think they're very much coming from that arena. It seemed very interesting to me that Jonathan Nolan is so entrenched in this technological world whereas any accounts that we've had of Christopher Nolan have been like oh he doesn't have a cell phone and he doesn't like emailing people and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Like Christopher's on the total luddite end of the spectrum and Jonathan's just like entrenched in it. I find that very cool. That is cool. And I and it's making me grow a lot more respect for Jonathan Nolan seeing some of the the ways that he talked about the show in that uh in that interview so people check that out i'll try to include a link in the show notes but they're they're an interesting duo i'm sure they're fun to to talk to because i know jonathan's much more american yeah and christopher is much more english mm-hmm. and uh i think that that's because was jonathan born in the states i i don't know if he was born in the or states maybe born in, in england but moved over here he lived over here with whichever f- his right his mother I, th- I don't i don't know it looks like he was born in in london according to wikipedia okay um but and yeah so it i, I think that separation between them obviously it's cool yeah so i want a movie about the two nolan brothers <laughs> and then the third nolan brother who's like a criminal who's like <laughs> no he is there's there's a oh, third really? one that's like yeah he was like a fugitive in like in like cuba or something wow oh yeah it's crazy well there's another Nolan. A lot more to learn about the Nolans. Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, we did have a little piece of feedback for our first episode. Uh, Jason wrote in and said, Black Hole Sun and Paint It Black on the Player Piano. Then Johnny Cash, uh, Ain't No Grave to Close It Out. Mm-hmm. Best music choices ever. Looking forward to Westworld FM. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, the Paint It Black uh, kind of orchestral yes. piano thing was so good. It was cool. <laughs> yeah. 
Plus, while Rodrigo Santoro is, you know, luring you in on the screen with all that playing, it was it was very very cool. It was a fun scene. Yeah. All right. Paint so it black is actually heavily heavily referenced in the Dark Tower series. Also, really, there's a lot of paint it black going on in that as well. Interesting. Hmm. Actually, it's we're gonna get a real. They're not gonna, they're not so different from each other in yeah. ways. <laughs> uh, I can't wait. I can't wait for you to see the Dark Tower. I can't wait to see the Dark Tower, but uh, yeah. I'm, as someone who hasn't read the books, I really want to hear kind of how you how you take it all digest in. Like, what the you show think of a little it. bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I I'm I'm enjoying it quite. As somebody who doesn't really care for westerns, God, I love this show. Yeah, we gotta <laughs> fix that. We got a lot to do. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. So I think that kind of wraps up our discussion of the show. We've gone a little bit long this time, but there was a lot to unpack in that first episode. Uh, so usually we're going to try to aim to be about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, we'll see if that stays true for this show, but it seems like there's so much to chew on that. I don't know how, how likely that is. Um, but yeah. So once again, uh, you can find more episodes of our podcast on westworld.fm. Uh, we're also on iTunes, Stitcher radio, Google play music, uh, tune in radio, all that good stuff. Check us out on those, uh, on those services, search for Westworld FM, uh, we're also Westworld FM on Twitter, and you can email us at westworldfm at gmail.com to tell us what you think of our show and share your thoughts on HBO's Westworld so we can read them on air. Uh, let us know what you think about our crazy theories or any crazy theories that you have, and uh, send us corrections, observations, or anything about Westworld or our podcast. Uh, if you are into video games, we are part of the Midwest Podcast Network. The show is on that network. And we also have a video game podcast called the Midwest Game Nerds Podcast. You can check that out at MidwestGameNerds.com. And there's also a couple more episodes coming of the Midwest Film Nerds Podcast if you haven't checked that out already. And uh, Gone to Texas is our Preacher recap show. Go check that out if you've got access to the first season of Preacher that aired this past year, uh, earlier in this year. And then, uh, yeah, that's it for our episode this week. We're excited for episode two, and we'll have another episode of our podcast out after that. But until then, may you rest and have a deep and dreamless slumber.